a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. But something very extraordinary is happening this weekend. One of the most exciting, relevant and in-demand preachers in the world has arrived on our shores. Will Graham will be in the spotlight and in the eyes of the nation as he brings the presentation of the gospel to the Gold Coast in Queensland on Saturday night. Now, why is this significant? Because when Will's grandfather, the late Billy Graham, first preached the gospel on our shores back in 1959, it was the closest that Australia had ever come to national revival. Now, Will Graham follows in the footsteps of his father Franklin and his grandfather Billy Graham. Will Graham carries the family name and he has shared the hope of Jesus with more than a million people across the globe since 2006. It's our absolute privilege to be able to welcome Will Graham to the studio. Hey, Will, a special welcome to Australia and to 2020. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's great to be here uh, in Queensland. Let me start with this family connection. I mean, the weight of pressure and expectation that's been on your shoulders. Uh, You are the the next generation uh, in the Graham family. Uh, This is something, though, that you've been able to carry uh, ever since maybe the mid to early 2000s when you really began to capture something of a calling from God on your life. Yeah, it was uh, early 2000s where I felt like uh, God was calling me to preach the gospel like my grandfather, like my father. Uh, I had been a pastor for a number of years and uh, loved it. I was pastoring a little church in North Carolina and I uh, loved it. And uh, But then one day God called me away and said, I want you to be an evangelist. And so I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't really looking for that. Uh, but that's what God did. God had a different assi- assignment for me. And so I've been trying to help my father at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and um, trying to help him best I can and help spread the news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what brings me to Australia this time. No doubt in your formative childhood, teenage years, uh, you would have spent many a weekend away and sitting in the congregation, perhaps, watching your grandfather preach, then watching your father preach. What memories do you have of those early times? Well, I've been to quite a few of them, Uh, obviously not all of them. And um, uh, and I have a memory, quite a few members. I remember one time we were in, um, uh, it was in Anaheim, California. Anaheim is famous for Disneyland. That's where Disneyland is. Uh, the original Disneyland was in, uh, is from Anaheim, California. And I was sitting in Anaheim. This is where the baseball team, the Angels, play. It's a huge stadium, about 90 plus thousand people. You guys just had 90,000 down at the MCG for your Queensland, or the state of origin game. Yep. Um, but this was a little bit over 90,000 people down there. And uh, I remember I was sitting in the crowd and um, not paying attention, you know, talking to some people, talking to my brothers and stuff like that. And uh, my granddaddy called out my name. And I was like, how in the world did he know I wasn't paying attention? And uh, what now, what I soon found out that he was talking about the will of God not Will Graham. And uh, so, <laughs> so, man, I was like, I thought he had caught me, uh, you know, talking to somebody and goofing off, uh, you know, with all 90,000 people in the stadium, he saw me. Uh, but it wasn't. He was talking about the will of God, uh, not his grandson, Will Graham. So uh, <laughs> that, 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 that was a little bit of a, you know, whew, that, was a, that was a close one. And that a lot of teenagers would be able to really relate with the idea goofing off during yeah. the message. Uh, you know, the important message, and here you are, the grandson of the great Billy Graham, and surely you'd be there sitting attentive. Um, those sort of teenage things, you know, where you are laughing, joking with your friends. You know, you're sitting in the back row thinking, oh, my goodness, here we go again. Uh, those sorts of development things are just normal part of anyone's life, and you had those too. It, it, it is. It is. And, you know, for me, um, most people, you know, you think of you think of Billy Graham, you have an image of Billy Graham in your mind. When when I when you say Billy Graham to me, I don't see big time evangelists. I see my grandfather. So I see it in a different lens than most than the average person because I'm his 
grandson. Uh, he's granddad to me. He's my grandfather to me. Um, and so uh, I love him for that matter, not for being an evangelist, which I'm grateful that he is. And I'm grateful for the wonderful ministry that he's had over all these years. And I'm thankful for that. And I knew it was God that was working through him. But when I still see Billy Graham, I don't see an evangelist. I see my grandfather. And so uh, for me, you know, uh, did I goof off with my granddaddy? Yeah, we had fun together. Um, he never joked a little, uh, but once in a while he would. And that's what was so rare is to see him actually joke with his grandkids. And uh, it caught me off guard one time. And so I got a lot of wonderful memories of my granddad. I'm very grateful. Uh, for the most part, we well, we're pretty well-behaved kids, um, especially when we were in the stadium listening to my granddaddy. You know, but once in a while when you're, when you're pretty young, you, you can only sit still for so long. You know, even in America, you can, you can only sit for so long. And, uh, but I love watching my granddaddy. But like my, when my grandfather would come on television, we'd be so disappointed because our normal scheduled program wouldn't be, be able to watch you know, our special program that we wanted to see. No, it's canceled for the night because now we have a Billy Graham special. And we'd be like, oh, like that was the worst. Because <laughs> we just couldn't watch TV when we wanted to. We had to, we had to be good to go be able to watch TV. Otherwise, we had to play outside. So TV was uh, something special for us. And so when my granddad came on and our regular program wasn't seen, we had to watch him. We just chose to go to bed. <laughs> Do you think that grandfather Billy Graham ever had an aspiration that somehow or other his son Franklin and his grandson Will uh, would follow in his footsteps, that doors would open? Is there something we can understand from even a biblical foundation about the way that the gifting and the uh, passion for what he did might pass on to a next generation? Well, I don't think he ever saw that. And the reason I say that is because they thought it was only going to last for a few years. I mean, they really thought that they're going to strike while that iron's heart. That's why you saw them do all these crusades so quickly, especially in the 1940s to the 1950s. All these crusades were boom, 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 because they thought it was going to be a small window and it's going to be over. Like the, the, the move of God was just going to be there and then it was going to go away. And so he just he wanted to strike while that iron is hot. That's a euphemism in America. I don't know if that translates into uh, Australian, but uh, you know, we want to strike while it was hot. And um, so I didn't think, I don't think he ever saw my dad was born in uh, 52. So even some of my granddad's, uh, some of his first crusades, his big ones, my, my dad had, uh, hadn't been born yet. So I'm not sure if he was saying, Oh, this is something that my son's going to do. Cause he didn't think he was going to be able to finish it in his own lifetime, like it was going to continue. So more or less his grandson. So, uh, but I think he's very proud. You know, he knew that the work of evangelism would continue. Um, he probably never imagined that it would be his son and his grandson one day uh, that would uh, continue it. We've just been um, very blessed by the Lord to be able to do this. It's a challenging expectation, isn't it, uh, that Billy might have thought that Franklin would follow in his footsteps and that you might follow, because that leads us, of course, to the fact that you've got three children, uh, two daughters, Christine and Rachel. You've got a son who is William Franklin Graham. Is he uh, in line to, or is there pressure on him, do you think, to you know continue the family tradition? No, um, I never put, my father never put, pressure on me my grandfather never put pressure on my father um because th this has to be a calling of god um you can inherit a, a family business you can inherit a company you know if you're if your dad or granddad started a company you can inherit that but when it comes to ministries that's something you do not inherit those are given by god they're not ours to inherit they're to they're for, of god and for god to give to people whom he chooses he, he gave it to my granddaddy uh, now he's chosen to give it to my father. Does it, will he give it to me one day? I, I don't know. That's the Lord. The Lord has to give it. Uh, it's not my dad's to give away. And so um, um, I believe that the Lord's leading me that way. Uh, for my son, I don't try to put any pressure on him. He's got different talents, different gifting. Uh, my son just graduated high school, so he's on his way to, to the university now. Um, he's going to be studying computer engineering. He wants to my son wants to build the first unhackable computer and computer program. That's his, that's his dream in life is to come up with that. And the, he's very, very smart and very talented in that area. And so I, I pray that whatever he does, he does it for the glory of God. And um, 
And so I want to push him toward that direction. And he's, and he's here with me um, here in Australia. This is his first time to Australia. So he's uh, learning the new delicacies over here and uh, different time zones. <laughs> he's the handsome one in the crowd. Yes. And the younger <laughs> one, that's for sure. Hey, have you come to Australia with a particular message that you want to bring to our nation uh, or that you might bring to the Australian church? Is there something that listeners might be able to glean? Uh, is there something special about the message that you'll deliver on Saturday night when you're speaking on the Gold Coast? Well, the, every time I come to the Australia, I, I want to preach the gospel. So anytime I preach, it's it's going to focus on the cross of Jesus Christ because that's the only way that we can have forgiveness of sins. That's the most important message I can tell people. That w- There's so many people in this world that are trying to do good and hoping that at the end of life that they can get to heaven because of all the good things that they've done. The good has outweighed the bad. And I'm here to tell you that's not the way it works. And there's no way that you you can be 99% good. You can do one bad act in your whole life and you're out. I mean, you are out. And um, so basically means that there's no one here with hope. And so that's why I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ said, I know you can't do it, so I'm going to do it for you. And that's why he died on a cross for our sins. And all we have to do is accept it like a gift. So here's a here's a good example. I love um, when I travel, I try to bring, especially when my children were young, I like to buy them a gift from that country. Um, Australia, I brought my, I, th- I think I bought my son a, um, I can't remember it, they may be. I don't think they're the same, but like uh, I think it was a it was a rugby ball though. Okay, I, I couldn't remember if it was AFL or a rugby. But I think I bought him a little rugby ball, and I bought it and I brought it to him, and I, I would want my son to have that as a gift. I paid for it. I brought it, gave it to him. Brought it halfway around the world so I could give it to him. Cost me some money. I paid for it, and when I give it to my son, I want him to have it. All he has to do is is to receive it, to accept it. Uh, I don't stick out my hand saying, now pay me back. You know, um, he doesn't have to earn it. I, I love it. I just, I love him. I love this gift. I want him to have it. I want him to experience it. The great things I've seen here in Australia, I want him to experience that too, you know. And um, and so all he can do is receive it. And that's the same thing spiritually. Christ has paid the bill. He's bought the rugby ball. He's paid for it. All you do have to do is to receive it. And the rugby ball is the forgiveness of sins. And that's how our sins are forgiven. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. Only God can give it to you. All you can do is to receive it. It's a free gift. It costs God something. It costs God his only begotten son. And so that's the message I want to leave with Australia, that it's found in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And that's what's key about this. There's no other way. It has to come through Christ. And that's what I want to leave with the Australian church and to the country. Will, if I ask you about influence, because oftentimes when someone comes to Christ, uh, they make a personal decision to follow him. Uh, They often will take that message back to their family, uh, back to their community. People see a transformed life and people are changed because there's a level of leadership that leads in that direction. Change then influences a community, a a town, a city, and even a nation. And uh, wonderful to be able to talk to you about this because you've got the family heritage here where it wasn't your grandfather who was knocking on the door of people who were commanding the corridors of power But those people commanding the corridors of power and talking about presidents of the United States Mm -hmm. were knocking on your father's door. Mm -hmm. Tell us about influence. What are your thoughts here about how the gospel influences a society? Well, it it influences one individual at a time. And uh, sometimes it will be a, a king or queen or a president that will hear it and give their life to Christ. There's going to be many those leaders who are going to reject it uh, because they feel like they're the ultimate in power and ultimate authority, and they don't want to bow their knee to anybody else. But the, from the biblical standpoint, from the Bible, when you read the Bible, there's one king that stands out above them all, and he was a, and he was referred to as the head of gold. His name was Nebuchadnezzar, 
And from God's perspective, when I say God's perspective, because he was the head of gold, the greatest empire of the biblical account, he was the head of gold, the most powerful of all the leaders. And uh, he thought himself, he thought a lot of himself. And God humbled him. And, um, and then a few years later, he looked up to heaven, the Bible says, and he acknowledged God for who he was. And uh, God restored his kingdom to him, restored his sanity to him. And he was a blessing to the, to the people of God. And, uh, and so there, you can, I mean, the, the most powerful man in the world, in the world, was Nebuchadnezzar at one time. And he would end up, I believe I'm going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. When you look at his, his, uh, his last message, I mean, it's, it's one of the greatest proclamations of the gospel is what God can do for you. I think he's in heaven. And, uh, and it would be Daniel who had influence on Nebuchadnezzar. It was Nebuchadnezzar, go get me Daniel. Go get me Daniel. Go get me Daniel. And because Daniel had influence, he represented the king of kings, the lord of lords. Now he's influencing his king. Even when the king was wrong, uh, Daniel would be obedient. Daniel would, uh, for the most part, obey. There's times he did disobey when it came to his dietary. But for the most part, he did what his king asked him of doing. So he had a huge influence on his king, and therefore it would have a huge influence over the whole nation. And so my grandfather, my grandfather only asked to meet with one president ever in his life, and uh, that was Harry Truman. Harry Truman, this would be at the very end of World War II, our President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is known as FDR, uh, he would die while in office. He was the longest serving president in the history of the country. World War II would start under him, but he would die in the middle of the war toward the end. Harry Truman came in, and he's the one that would tro- drop the atomic bomb. That's what he's known for. And, uh, and I say all this because Harry Truman was the first one my grandfather asked for to meet with. It was a total disaster. It went bad. It was bad. He, the media tricked him into giving up some information. He was ignorant on protocol about what you talk about to the press regarding your, what you said to the president or what the president said to you. you. You're supposed to be quiet on that stuff. And he went out and talked to everybody about it. And Truman was ticked, uh, mad. And so it took years for my granddad to repair that. And after that, my grandfather never asked to meet with another president. He just said, God, that's up to you. And then God allowed him to meet another 12 presidents, another 12 presidents. So my grandfather has known more U.S. presidents than anybody else in the history of the world and had an impact on their life for the gospel because he represented the true king, the one king, Jesus Christ. And because of that, God opened up doors for him to be an ambassador to other people around the world. Your grandfather was known for his integrity. And sometimes we wonder that if I'm going to align myself with Christ and pursue a level of integrity that's in line with his expectation of me, that somehow or other that will be a repelling thing. But he found that was actually magnetic because Mm -hmm. power does want to be aligned with integrity. Uh, Any thoughts here? Because as you're relaying things like, you know, kingdoms can rise and kingdoms can fall. Um, Power can come, power can leave. Uh, You could be left uh, eating, I think, uh, grass in the field uh, Mm -hmm. before a restoration comes and repentance and restoration. But integrity is a a necessity uh, in the... Uh, in the ingredients of the individual, if you're going to be a minister of the gospel, would you? What are your thoughts here? Well, you you got to definitely have integrity. Um, and if you, if you're a believer of Christ, it has to that has to be one of the fruits <laughs> that is shown in your life is integrity. And my granddaddy, he knew that was an Achilles' heel for a lot of uh, different other evangelists in our country. He saw that, and so he he took steps to avoid that. Um, and so he, he and his friends got together and this is before the Los Angeles crusade. This is before he started the Billy Graham evangelistic association. He got his team together and said, let's, let's, let's look at all the pitfalls, all these things that happen to preachers and how do we avoid this? And, uh, it's been dubbed the Modesto manifesto. This is Modesto, California. 
And so uh, his good friend Cliff Barrows dubbed it the Modesto Manifesto, and it deals with different aspects. It deals with uh, meeting with women privately, which they weren't going to do, uh, dealing with money, dealing with um, talking about other pastors. You know, you're going to talk good about other pastors. You're not going to – we'll never discourage another pastor. Um, it was things like this that they would build their ministry on. Let their yes be a yes, their no to be a no. They're not going to exaggerate results. You know, because a lot of preachers are saying, yeah, we had right under 100,000 people in Kalgoorlie. I'm just going to pick up a town that yeah. you guys would be familiar here yeah. in Kalgoorlie, all right? We had right under 100,000. There ain't no 100,000 people in Kalgoorlie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the real, we'll just say 15,000 mm-hmm. or 20,000 people, all right? Well, there's not even close to 100,000. But we said, well, we said under 100,000. Well, okay, so you're legally maybe not a liar, but everyone knows that you lied. My granddad said, we're not going to do that. We're going to let other people count and tell us the number. And so that's why he, he had great integrity, and that's why people trusted him. Before we take any calls at all, Will, uh, let me just ask you to reflect on Australia, uh, the fact that your grandfather Billy was here back in 1959. That's not a secret, that that is the closest we've ever come in Australia to national revival. Something like three million people attended events, Mm -hmm. and it was incredible. And uh, we reflect on that as a very significant time. Is there anything in your perspectives um, coming to Australia as Billy's grandson and your own reputation growing so significantly as it is, uh, that there may be something significant in remembering that time of revival? Well, it it was a very significant time. Matter of fact, my grandfather said it was the last time he saw a great revival take place was Australia, 1959. Now, he would come back in 69, he would come back in 79. But he never saw in those, it, his own success was the problem. Because in 69, 79, he said people were expecting, well, we're just going to have it again. Billy Graham's coming. We'll just have another big revival like we did in 59. And they didn't put the work into it. They weren't praying about it like they should have. And Not that, that God didn't work, but... Their expectation was that Billy Graham had it in a box. He opens it up, and revival pops out uh, because of the success of Fifty Nine. Fifty Nine was it was impressive. You're talking about uh, I think twenty four to twenty six percent of the whole entire population walk or heard my granddaddy. Four percent of the entire population walked forward. In other words, they made a, a commitment to God. Of uh, the premier of New South Wales said that crime came to an end for a few months or a few weeks. Uh, while Billy Graham was there because it just uh, people were all focused on God, reading their Bibles, and uh, crime came to a standstill. Uh, it's, I guess it's picked back up by now. But, uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying, it really was. A, it was really, my granddad said in his eyes, it was the last great revival that he ever saw in his lifetime was what took place here in 59. And you say the preparation matters a lot because uh, 69 and beyond, uh, lack of preparation, take it for granted, Uh, Billy's bringing the move of God with him, but the move of God is happening not because of necessarily one individual who might deliver the message, but because the community is is passionate and hungry for revival. That's gone on too in the preparation for what's happening here on Saturday night because the program that you run, the Christian Life and Witnessing class, and you've got your team and they've been on deck on the Gold Coast and Mm -hmm. training Gold Coast people. Any reflection on that? Because a lot of people think it's just an event and you turn up and you speak and that's it, but a lot of preparation goes into this. this, We've come, we we just did not spin the globe and, you know, close our eyes and put our finger down saying, ooh, we're going to the Gold Coast. No, we come at an invitation. And so this invitation, it's, and my granddaddy did this. My dad does this. It's when you get an invitation, you, you come because people invited you. And these people are churches. These churches have come together and said, we want to see a move of God in our community here at the Gold Coast. And so you got all these different denominations. We got 17 different denominations, over a thousand different people, over 360 different churches all working together to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So this is just not Will Graham. This is a team of people in that area, in the Gold Coast area, that said, yes, we want to see God move in our community. And so we're very thankful for this opportunity. And we've been training. We've been working with people, training them on how to share their faith. We've been training them how to and let them participate as a counselor. Uh, so when people come forward, they can le- help lead them to Christ. 
And uh, no, we're we're going to prepare all of them for this. We're just not going to say, all right, let's just, let's go do this. No, we're going. That's why we spent over a year worth of preparation, getting the things ready, praying, getting the churches ready, so that we can really see a great move of God there at the Gold Coast. And there's something like a thousand people on the Gold Coast who've gone through this formal training, mm-hmm. and they are going to be on hand because there's going to be a harvest on Saturday. That's right. There will be people who will respond to the message and they'll come forward. And they need someone who is going to be a trusted friend to be able to follow them up and to help them get on that pathway to their discipleship and onto maturity in Christ. That is a powerful thing. It is. And, you know, and they're there to help answer questions. Like I have a, a Jewish friend that used to work for us at our organization. And when he came to know Christ, he's a Jewish man, he gave his life to Christ. And uh, he said he's wanting to know. So, uh, what do I do now? Do I build a temple or something? You know, like like what what do I do now? You know, like no, no, that's not what you go do. You know, but we just had to help answer some questions. You know, like what's the next steps? You know, how to get them plugged into the local church? We're going to help people if they don't have a church to go to. Hey, here's some great churches that we recommend. There, there's some right around the corner from your home. This would be a great place for you to go to church and be get plugged in. We want to see the local church encouraged to grow, not just spiritually, but numerically too, to see it strengthen. And that's our goal is to work with the local church. This is not about Will Graham. It's not about the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. It's about the church because the church is still going to be here next week or next month after I go home. You know, the the church is going to be here, and we want to see the church encouraging these people and working with these people to to bring them to maturity in Christ. No doubt this is where reputation matters too. And those earlier generations, uh, the Franklin Graham, the Billy Graham, the reputation that comes, because when churches now want to get together and do something together, the trustworthiness that's come with the reputation that's built around the world means that churches can group together because sometimes churches are suspicious of one another and, uh, you know, do I want my people to be exposed to this person? But you come and you've been able to uh, jump all of those barriers and bring a presentation of the gospel that all of those different denominational differences can all say, this is what we're going to agree on. This is what can make a difference in your life. That's right. Because, I mean, when we're looking at 17 different denominations, that means that there's 17 different ways of doing church. Not that there's one wrong and one that's right, but what they're saying is, you know, we differ on this and this, but this core thing, the gospel, that Jesus Christ loved sinners and he died for sinners on a cross and that we just have to receive it as a gift by faith. That's the centrality of the Christian gospel. And that's why that's the message that we promote. That's the message that I preach. And so all these churches can say, eh, we can be a part of that. Yeah, are we going to disagree on a few things? Yeah, but those are the minor things. This is the major thing. And uh, so we want to, that's why this thing is so wonderful to me, in my mind, so wonderful. Look at the unity of churches coming together for one purpose, to see their friends and family and neighbors come to know Christ. Well, let's take a call. Our talkback line open, 1-800-316-316. Anne is in Labrador. Hey, Anne, welcome. Oh, welcome. It's great. It's great just to talk to you. Um, I'm hoping to be there. Um, on, I'm going to be there um, on the Gold Coast. I was too young, um, too young to see your grandfather, but... My prayer is also that you get many um, non-Christians there and that they will listen to this message. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the future of revival through that message on the Gold Coast. And wonderful thought. And uh, your response, Will? Yeah, it, you're exactly right. Because this is, you know, sometimes we we think, well, this is just for the church. And this isn't just for the church. Like like you said, it, it's this is where the church brings their lost friends and their family members, like their neighbors, that they, they don't know Christ. And they're, listen, there are people looking for answers in life. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for purpose, and they can't find it. And that's why, and ironically, that's why everyone goes to the Gold Coast. They're looking for fun. They're looking for excitement. They're looking for love. They're looking for meaning. And they And you know what? They come. And they leave, and they still haven't found it. 
because it's a person. It's Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to introduce people to. We want to see lost people, people that don't know Jesus Christ personally, and see them come to know faith. And so I would, I hope that you will come and uh, visit and see us there. But I hope that you bring someone that doesn't know Christ with you, okay? That's, going, that's, going, that's my uh, encouragement to you bring someone that doesn't know christ with you and it's a free event it's on saturday night mm-hmm. take a friend with you thank you so much for your call let's just focus on friends for a few moments here the value of bringing a friend and i know that for uh, many decades now uh, you've had a focus on helping people understand the value of friendship and taking a friend along to an event like this because not everyone's confident to be able to lead their friend to a personal relationship with Christ. Uh, But you like to focus on Andrew as a character in the Bible who brought his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. And and that's the model that we use. Just you bring a friend... Uh, that doesn't know Christ. Listen, we're and we're gonna have a, a great program. We're gonna have great music. We got Taya. Uh, she's been helping my dad, and uh, she's been singing all around the world for years now. Uh, and listen, she's from she's right down the road from you guys. I mean, she's a she's a she's a Queenslander, and uh, so you can have her right here too. I think she Lismore is Lismore, New South Wales, or uh, it's Northern New South Wales. All right, so she's right across the border. And, uh, you know, but she's going to be here with uh, her husband and her small child. And uh, uh, we're going to have a great, uh, we got an American band. We got Planet Boom from down in uh, uh, Victoria. And so we're going to have some great music. It's going to be done well. Everything's going to be great, done well. Uh, But it's for one purpose, to see people put their faith and trust in Christ. And so we want you to know that when you come to it, we're going to have great music. It's going to be a great program. I'm going to preach the gospel and then give people a chance to respond and that's what this is all about will your impressions of australia you've been here a time or three Uh, you've done some uh, outreaches in places like in kalgoorlie and uh, broken hill and alice springs and uh, in tasmania what are your impressions of australia and our faith, uh, because typically we're very secularized here in Australia. Uh, what are you seeing in the Australian people? Well, it, it's it's not much different than America, to be honest. Um, uh, maybe at different stages, but very similar. And so I, I remember sitting on an airplane one time, and it was uh, there was some type of big game that had just happened. Maybe it was State of Origin. I don't know, but this is years ago, years ago, and uh, a lot of the famous athletes were getting on the plane and everybody was kind of whispering and talking. And the guy beside me was trying to explain to me who are all these famous people. I didn't, obviously I didn't know him. And, uh, he was, uh, so we started talking and, uh, and he said, you know, you know, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. That gives me a great, usually that's an, a conversation killer <laughs> or it opens up doors. This case, it opened up doors. He said, really? He said, uh, he said, who do you preach for? And I said, well, I preach for an organization called the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. He goes, I've heard of that. He came to our church years ago. Now, he would he say, I'm not religious, but he knew the name Billy Graham, and he knew what that meant for Australia. And so it just opened up four doors to talk about spiritual things all of a sudden. So to me, there's a, um, yes, you're very secular, but there to me, there is still a strong spiritual seed in the heart of Australians for those who grew up here. Uh, you know, like when I say grew up here, that uh, I know you have a lot of immigrants coming in, uh, and they would know who Billy Graham is for some of them, but for the Australians, they knew their grandparents listened to Billy Graham. They knew, uh, they heard that name before, whether they're religious or not. So they, they have a nice, they're very friendly toward me. They have a friendly connotation towards, but they, uh, they'll talk about spiritual things. And so it's always wonderful to be able to talk about spiritual things to Total stranger sitting on an airplane. I got a captive audience. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> That's right. You're sitting next to them on a flight. Hey, speaking of flights, uh, looking up at a plane, uh, Look Up is the title of a Look Up celebration. Uh, when people are thinking of Look Up, what do you think that really means? Uh, is there something in there that says, hey, Auss- Aussies, uh, don't be looking at your mobile device or looking at the ground or uh, being depressed there's something more. What are you thinking of when you say look up? When we say look up, it's look up to heaven. There's, that's where our hope and our answers come from. It, it, they're not going to come from your government. Uh, and and, I, and when I say that, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of the 
of Albanese or, you know, parliament down in Canberra or anything like that. I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying our answers aren't going to come from government, whether it's the American government, Australian government, British government. That's not where our answers are going to come from. They're going to come from heaven. And that's why we need to keep our eyes focused on heaven and look to heaven. What does God have to say to us? That's what's really important. And when we start to line up our life according to God's rules, God's way, you'll start to see things here on earth start to make sense and start to change. And that's why I want to put focus not on Will Graham, not to focus on America, not to focus on politics, but to focus up on Jesus Christ and him alone. Let's take another call. Grant is in Perth, WA. Hey, Grant, welcome along. Hey, guys, how you doing? Very well. What are your thoughts? Well, I just wanted to agree with what he's just said there. Well, it's not about what country it is. It's not about where you are. It's about, as you said, Jesus Christ and spreading and t- spreading the gospel on every corner of this planet. So, And I was, um, like, fell into depression for six months and fell out of my old church. And I could not get out of my bed to go find another church. But I went to Centrelink and I had my God Got Me hat on. And basically, there was two young ladies in there who said it. It was very, very nice. And we got to chatting, and they introduced me to a new church, where, which I can't thank God enough. We put those two ladies in there and me in the same place, and I found a, a beautiful church that's spreading and growing all over the planet as we speak every week, and that's Kingdom City. Wonderful stuff, Grant. Uh, This is an important element here because uh, going along to church, this is an important thing. Sometimes we don't feel like we fit so well in our church. Other times, like Grant here, who's got a most incredible, amazing experience of church. Uh, And what are your thoughts here for Grant? Well, I tell you what, you know, Grant, I appreciate you calling in, buddy. Thank you. And, uh, you know, one of the most exciting things for me is when I get to go to church and I have a pastor that opens up God's word and just teaches me God's word. And listen, I'm a guy that went to seminary. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I don't know the Bible. There's going always, there's always someone who knows the Bible more than me. There's a lot of people, but what I'm here to say is that I love learning and I love when God or, uh, God leads me to a church where they open up God's word and they just teach God's word. And I learn and, and, uh, that has a huge impact on my life and it brings encouragement to me. It helps me to change my ways and keeps me looking toward heaven instead of the things in my hands or in the things of this world. And, man, that that changes my life and changes my heart. Now, I'm glad you found a church like that. And uh, I pray that you'll just bring more friends that are – you got friends, Grant, that need to know Christ too. So uh, you start bringing those friends just like those girls encourage you. You go find some other people and bring them with you as well. All right, buddy? Wonderful encouragement. Grant in Perth, thank you so much for your call. A time is running short. Let's come back to what's happening on Saturday night at the Gold Coast Convention and Exhibition Centre. Now, some people will say, oh, well, they've gone the gold standard. Uh, That's the biggest venue there on the Gold Coast. Uh, Of course, you've got to have a big venue when you've got a Graham name coming to speak. But you don't do these things half-heartedly. The opportunity Mm. is there to get the biggest venue, to provide that for free. And some people will say, how does it happen for free? I mean, surely everyone else who hires that venue uh, charges a ticket price. Uh, How does all that happen, Will? Because uh, something special about the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association that wants to create opportunity for people to come and hear the gospel. Neil, that's a great question. And Listen, these things are, they are expensive, all right? Um, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has donors that have helped pay for this, but a lot of it has been paid by Australians that have a burden and a love for their own city down in the Gold Coast, and not just from their city. There's Christians from all over Australia that say, you know, we want to be a part of this too, and they've sent some money uh, so it can be free. So it, it still costs something. This is a, here, and I won't get to this because this is a, a real important spiritual truth here. It does cost something, it costs greatly, but it's been paid for by people who love you, you know, people that are caring for their community. They're paying for it. And that's the same thing spiritually. Listen, Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin, but yet he gives it to us freely. And that's where you're trying to be an example of that by allowing people to come, have a wonderful program, great sound system, you know, great music, great leaders in that sense. 
and then we're just going to preach the gospel, allow people to make a response to the gospel. But it had to be paid for, and it's been paid by the locals and other believers from America that felt paid for it. And so that it can be free, so that you can enjoy it for free, but there is a cost to it. And that's the same thing spiritually. There is a cost. Jesus died on a cross for you and I so that we could receive a free gift of salvation to have our sins forgiven for free because Jesus paid the price. Not that it's a bad thing to stand in a field, but you've got this wonderful opportunity in a fabulous venue to be able to invite a friend to. So it's one of those things you might even not feel so comfortable inviting your friend to come and meet out in the middle of the field or on a beach or wherever it might be. But you can not be embarrassed to invite a friend to go along and see a free event. And it's on this Saturday night. Uh, This doesn't happen every day of the week, so it's something special and extraordinary that is happening. It's called the Look Up Celebration with Will Graham. It is free, it is family friendly, and it is on the Gold Coast at the Gold Coast Convention and Exhibition Centre in Broadbeach in Queensland. It is going to be live streamed over the Vision app. So wherever you're listening to us around Australia, you've got the Vision app on your mobile device. You'll be able to listen to the live stream of that event on Saturday evening. Check your time zone for when that will happen. Of course, it's going to feature amazing music from those award-winning Christian bands, The Afters and Taya and Planet Boom. It really will be an amazing event. Here is the website if you want to get more details billygraham.org.au forward slash look up or you can go straight to the lookupcelebration.com website lookupcelebration.com and you'll be able to get the details of the event this Saturday night on the Gold Coast in Queensland. Will Graham, it has been an absolute privilege having you in the studio and I know that listeners all around Australia will just be uh, you know, feeling that sense of God's blessing on you, and I know that the prayers of the nation are going to be on you for that presentation of the gospel this Saturday night. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your heart with us today on 2020. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.